Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to a public session as part of the Strong Towns Community Action Lab. I would like that lots see lots of familiar faces as well as some that have uh, come particularly for this evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for participating in this. Uh, my name is Norm, and I'm the Director of Membership and Development for Strong Towns. And I'm going to begin our presentation tonight and then pass it on over to Edward Erfurt, who's the Director of Community Action. Uh, Ed's come out from West Virginia, and then Chuck uh, Marone, who you perhaps had an opportunity to hear in January or February with the kickoff session, uh, is out from Minnesota. Um, I should have disclosed I'm a Canadian, so be kind to me, um, <laughs> but also uh, I get to go home uh, to my family pretty soon here, and we'll be bringing back some great stories from my time in uh, Lake County. So it's been great to be here, and I want to begin with an encouragement for us. Uh, that we are in a time of great conversations. Chuck, Edward, and myself have participated in a whole day of conversations today. We had an extended session last night uh, out in um, the other community, that, uh, Claremont, that we were in. Uh, the, the person who was working at the front desk, she said, you guys really need to go now. And she had to say that several times because the conversations are gripping and people are realizing this, this is another venue and another opening and another opportunity to really connect with these core issues. And one of our goals is to make sure that these conversations persist. Sometimes that happens through, as, as we were talking about, uh, being able to decipher some of the language around urban plans, about the plans that being, are being made in the community, the different agencies, uh, creating a bit of an understanding of who is responsible for what, and finding ways to communicate that in, in ways that connect not just here, but also with the people you know that are maybe tuned out, or the people are, that are kind of freaked out, or the people that are just trying to figure things out. And that's how we believe that, in part through the Strong Towns Action Lab, uh, we can help to get uh, to that place. And so I got a call, or a, a message was left for me from our reception service from a guy named Tim from Wisconsin. And I was like, all right, uh, this is an interesting one, because uh, Tim had asked a question. He said, is Strong Towns a cult? <laughs> and it is essential to get the answer to that question right. It's dangerous to your health. It's dangerous to your marriage. It's probably dangerous to your personal finances if we answer this question in the wrong way. And, and the reality is, one, I should say, trust me, Strong Towns is not a cult, which I know I should not preface that with trust me, but trust me, it's not a cult. But the reason that Tim was asking this question was really striking to me. He started by saying, hey, I would have been a builder in Wisconsin uh, for, I think at that point, it was almost 60 years. He'd started as a 12-year-old, working with his dad, helping on different construction projects. Over time, he had taken over his father's business. He'd begun constructing all sorts of different projects throughout Wisconsin. And as time went on, he said, as he came, uh, got closer to retiring, he passed on the business to his son, and he said, things began to change. And he said, I'm concerned about the way that things are changing. I said, what I did is I built modest, responsible projects for farmers. My dad was a dairy farmer, and so we had lots of projects on our farm that my dad would construct, and if it got to a certain threshold, we would bring in a man named Baron Middlecoat. He was the only man that my mom allowed to smoke in the house because he was so important to us to make sure that the next level of more complicated things was being built. But even still, these were modest, careful, responsible investments that were being made. Uh, to conserve scarce resources. If you run a farm, if you run a, a, a business, you need to conserve scarce resources. If you run a household, uh, you need to do this because if you don't, you run out. Uh, we always say, you know, don't eat the, the seed that you intend to sow your fields with the following year. And there's so many critical principles there. He said he also had responsibilities in various communities to build small, modest commercial structures. Notice this structure. It is, it is perfectly adapted to a single business. It can be adapted to accommodate additional businesses by simply being expanded uh, to the left, to the right. Uh, there was opportunities to add a second story. If another parcel came along next beside it, they would be able to benefit from a shared wall. All of those types of projects. And he said, this is what I was building. Uh, private investment to build wealth. But it also applied to the public realm. He said, we had to use scarce public resources wisely. Uh, community managers would say, hey, I need a new water treatment facility. We need a pump house. Uh, but it would look, you know, a modest structure like this. Uh, it, was, it was discreet. It was responsible. It was careful. And it was with a view not only to the present day, but also to the future obligation that this new structure 
would one day need to be repaired, would need to be replaced, would need to be improved over time if the community grew, but at the same time not be so grand, so large, uh, that it was oversized for the first 30, 40, 50 years of its existence. And so he said, even with our public investments in great spaces, a public library, this would typically have a patron or several patrons that would be investing their funds, ensuring that the community was, was being able to display that they had confidence that the community that they were creating was a great place, a place worth being in. And yet they were using these public investments as a, as a means of signaling that this place was growing, was continuing to find within it the strength as well as the resources needed to flourish. And so he said, I, I would build even structures like this. But he said, in contrast, my son, my son took over the business and he started going after the big contracts. He took over the business and the big contracts are the ones coming from now, the municipality that was taking out a bond. It was coming from the federal government giving out large, very large grants uh, to communities all across the United States. And his son was going throughout Wisconsin and into Minnesota and other places and, and basically just shoveling in all of these great projects. And he said, on the one side, I'm really pleased that he's done so well. On the other side, I can't figure it out. How is it that these projects pencil? How is it that these large water treatment uh, facilities that are built uh, to accommodate 80 years worth of future growth or big public schools that are built very fancily and yet lack the capacity within them to, to help build wealth within existing neighborhoods, often being built out on the outskirts of the community, uh, community centers, big ice rinks up in Wisconsin and, and other things like this. And he said that the scale had changed so dramatically. And it wasn't that his son was a much better builder than him. It was just that his son was pursuing a very different game, a game of securing liability-laden projects that were going to be a liability for decades uh, to come. And so Tim's contention is that we have lost sight of what it takes to build lasting prosperity in our places. That is what it takes in order to have the resources on hand to endure through hard times and to be able to flourish within good times but not to do so in a way that sells the farm, not to do so in a way uh, that binds you into future obligations. And so tonight what we wanna talk about is the re recognition, oh. um, is, is the premise uh, that our current path, and this is core to what Strong Towns is about, uh, this is also a core reason why Strong Towns has been engaged within Lake County by Lake County officials, by participants in this community, um, asking us to help them to grapple with this challenge. That our current path of rapid, expansive growth, almost at all costs or at, at deferred costs being pushed onto future generations, that this, which was meant as a means of securing prosperity for all, genuinely good intentions have been a, a key part of the construction of our current path. And yet it has unwittingly trapped us in a system that is incapable of building lasting prosperity. And if we begin to see this, it becomes very difficult to unsee this. And it begins to prompt in us a yearning and a desire to do something about this, to address this at a local level. We actually believe at, at Strong Towns that, that at the federal level and even the state level, many of the disputes, many of the struggles, many of the challenges there are almost beyond our scope. But what we do see is that when local residents take note of their local struggles, we can begin to see this, this pattern change, this current path become one that provides for new opportunities. Responsible growth in, in, in a sense of using scarce resources very wisely, at times learning what it takes to live with enough, rather than having to always live with the greater expectation of greater wealth or greater prosperity, uh, instead to be able to say, how can we create prosperity that works for all? I always like to say, I was a pastor for 10 years, so I'm like, prosperity is something which is prosperity broadly considered, pros the prosperity of the whole person, including financial security, but so much more than that as well. And so we need uh, to find a way. And so tonight, uh, as part of this, we do desire and are working towards that creation of a local path uh, to gradually restore the capacity uh, to, uh, uh, to create and to sustain uh, local prosperity. And so that's a core of what we're seeking to do 
Uh, some of it is problem solving. Some of it is, is diagnosing what's taking place. Uh, some of it is looking with fresh eyes saying, hey, a dude showed up from California or from uh, West Virginia, from Minnesota, and is going to ask certain questions, but at the same time is going to participate in within this community, finding ways uh, to establish a local path not a path for Minnesota, not a path for British Columbia, not one for West Virginia, but a path for Lake County. And we've heard clearly, Lake County is unique, distinctive, is composed of very distinct and unique communities that do not want to be confused with each other, and for good reason. <laughs> and along the way, what we can do together is help to ensure that these unique local communities are stronger in the decades to come, so that it isn't just this generation that enjoys the good things that are, have come through a rapid cycle of growth, but also generations to come. And so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Ed, uh, to take us into the next section here. Great. Thanks, Norm. So this is part of the Community Action Lab through Strong Towns. This is an inaugural program. Lake County is one of four communities this year that were selected out of 18 across North America to participate in this. Uh, the idea of this actually came out of Lake County. There were residents in your community that had listened to the Strongtown message and said, this is something that we need to bring to Lake County. We want to change everything, and we need to bring that here. This is not something typically what Strongtowns would do. It took a while to figure out what this would be and how we could get that messaging out. Um, so we're really excited about that and being invited to come here to Lake County. The goal of this entire program is something unique that you probably haven't heard from other folks that you may have listened to here in your community. The goal here is to change the conversation in Lake County. So the conversation changes at your public meetings, that this conversation begins to change within the city halls of all of your communities, and that out in the community when you're at your coffee shops, when you're at your barbecues, uh, when you're out at the soccer fields, you, the shift of the conversation is occurring there. New ideas are being discussed to address the issues that you have specifically here within Lake County. Our objective here at Strong Towns is that we are here to help your community think differently. We are not here to tell you what to do. Now, all of this content, we started with an action team of 26 members of your community that are public folks working within the public, but also working within local government. That action team is getting content and ideas, and we're sharing all of this with them in some really in-depth discussions. As we went through this program, we realized that just our Facebook ads and just the emails were not enough. People were asking for more and more insight. They wanted to understand what we were talking about in these ideas. We set up a website at strongtowns.org forward slash lake dash county. If you haven't already, go to this site. On this particular site, you can click that sign up to participate. It will open up an opportunity for you to preview some course material to learn about what the Community Action Lab is, to learn about what Strong Towns is, Get a second opinion that we are not a cult <laughs> is all on that site. That is available for anybody, so if you don't want to share your email with us, go ahead and take a look at that. But if you'd like to learn a little bit more, if you'd like to dive in a little bit more, you can give us your email address and you will be entered into our Community Action Lab course. Every two to three weeks, we're uploading new content. There's articles, there's videos, there's podcasts, the different uh, events we've had, all of these slides will be in there. And you can go in and look at this material, read through it. We will ask through this process some provocative questions. Unlike social media where we might have trolls going through on those sites, <coughs> this is for Lake County. There's a step that you have to take to get onto this site and there's an engagement that you can occur and undertake through the comments. The comments are visible to anybody that signs up for the site. So you can see what your neighbors are saying about, the, uh, about Lake County and their responses to these questions. You also will be, uh, we will have engagement with Strong Town staff. So if you put comments in there, we're doing our, our best to go out there and respond to answer your questions or ask more questions to learn 
more about Lake County and how these principles and ideas apply here. Back in January, Chuck proposed an idea in the community, and I can tell you it, it set some waves in the community. Uh, we actually had a developer get up at the table, pound his chest, and say, this is really, really dangerous. What these guys are saying is dangerous. I think it's an important message if that's the reaction we're getting. The idea is that we want you to understand that a municipal government is a public corporation. As a public corporation, the question we ask is, does a municipal government need to run a profit? This is the dangerous message, right? <laughs> what we want you to think about as a municipal corporation is that a municipal government, for it to stay in business, for it to operate, the revenues coming in through tax base, through permit fees, through all the activities you do as a city, need to be greater than the expenses, the obligations going out, paying for police, paying for fire, filling potholes on the road, making sure trash is picked up, code enforcement, all of these things that government needs to do, we've asked them to do, we need to make sure that those revenues coming in cover those expenses. We call this profit. As a municipal corporation, it's important that that formula results in profit. Now we're not talking about building a big bank and storing all that money up. We're talking about the, all the obligations at a city that are under the expenses that they have, under the promises that they have made, that there is enough revenue coming in to cover those expenses. We've heard on the news about governments that aren't able to do that. Unlike a failing business that doesn't make profit, where their expenses are greater than revenues, a failed government doesn't go away. You, there's cities in California, there's Detroit, there's cities all over the country that have go bankrupt. They're not like the Walmart where they board up the windows and they go down the road to some other place. They just linger on. These obligations are kind of like zombies. They, the obligations aren't met, they're still collecting revenue. And all the residents say, well, they're upset that they're not getting the services, even though they're paying a lot in taxes. They just linger on. We also, through the Community Action Lab, are going in depth about the Growth Ponzi scheme. What I will tell you is this is what is happening in Lake County. In this chart, all of the new development occurring in Lake County is generating transactions. It's generating wealth. Every new house that comes in, they're paying building permit fees, impact fees, sewer and water connection fees. Uh, all of this stuff is being collected and creating a large amount of revenue. With each one of these developments, there is infrastructure that is being given to the municipalities. So all of these subdivisions, all of these roads are given to the municipality at zero cost. We're making lots of money. However, we know that this infrastructure needs to be maintained. If there's a pothole, you want it filled. If the striping needs to be redone, it needs to get striped like every seven years. If the drainage of the road gets blocked, you expect somebody to come out to fix that. Um, if there's a park in the community that's been dedicated to the city, you expect that park to be in, in tip-top shape. At about 25 years, roads start to break down and we have to pay to have those fixed. In this growth Ponzi scheme, we can see where those transactions start to occur, where there's, the revenue may not be coming in to cover those expenses. As we go life cycle after life cycle, what we're seeing is the expenses to maintain that are greater than the revenue coming in to a break point. This is compounded. We don't see this happening in Lake County, this failure because you're very early in the Ponzi scheme. Your big building boom was back in the early 2000s, 25 years ago. We're beginning to see the cracks occur with this, but it's hidden with the amount of transactions that are occurring in Lake County. 
Through the action team, we've collected a lot of information about Lake County to understand what the pressures are. We've heard all about entitlement. Every meeting we've met with, we've talked about entitlement, and we've heard growth. The Regional Planning Council did a report back in 2017 or 2018 that is uh, described as, how did we grow? It looked at growth within Central Florida. There's a lot of great data in here. What it showed us is that in a 10-year time frame, Lake County saw 12,506 homes developed in Lake County. So boom-bust cycles, that is the 10-year uh, the cycle, so it's a pretty long, long spectrum of housing. We can calculate that down to about 1,200 homes a year are being constructed and developed in Lake County every year. We asked a simple question because entitlement was so uh, prominent in all of our discussions. How many units, how many houses have been entitled in Lake County? There is no single repository of information for that. We went to the school board, which is a, they had about 40,000. We talked to the development community. They said there were about a million. When we started to dial it down and ask cities what they had in their repository, there's anywhere from 55,000 to 90,000 entitled residential units in Lake County. Those are huge numbers. In West Virginia, that's more population than any city in the state of West Virginia. Um, but we know it's in that range. When we take the historic trends of development in Lake County, and we divide all those entitled units out. If there is no more development in Lake County, there's a, a that bad word moratorium occurs, and no more building, no more entitlement, you have 44 to 72 years of housing stock currently approved in Lake County. That's an even bigger number. What this is leading to with that type of growth and with the development pattern you have here, for all of the cities right now, the initial cost for development is minimal to all of your cities. You're getting miles and miles of road in Lake County. You're getting new parks, you're getting community buildings. It's not costing your cities anything because you require the developers to pay for it. So all of that infrastructure is coming in as soon as it's built, that is then dedicated to the municipality. To the public, the budget for new growth is substantial. And we heard this to, today in one of our sessions uh, here in Leesburg. It's substantial, the amount of money coming in, and that's what's funding the city, these transactions today, all this new growth. The catch is, and this is what hasn't resonated here, that we need to continue to reinforce, is that the public is agreeing to maintain all of those improvements, all of those roads, all of those parks, all those stormwater areas. And they're not gonna maintain it for five years or 10 years. The maintenance obligation and promises are forever. Now, I wanna talk about the traditional development pattern there are there's different ways that cities have developed over uh, throughout history. The traditional development pattern is the way that we have developed cities for thousands of years. This is a picture from Brainerd, Minnesota. Chuck described this in his first event. This was his town. The founding of his town is almost the same time that the, the original core cities were developed here in Lake County. This is how they first developed. I'm sure if I go to the Historical Society and I pull up pictures, all of the, uh, the differences, you didn't have pine trees like this, you actually had some palms um, and some other landscaping, but there were wooden shacks that were built in these communities. The public or the private sector made an investment and became leaders in that development. They developed these shacks. If one of these shacks failed at the billiard hall, was a problem and it closed down. There wasn't an economic uh, tidal wave in the markets. The town didn't go bankrupt. Uh, either a new business would go in, set of billiards, maybe it starts, or the building would be dismantled and it would be used for another building somewhere else in town. In this picture, there is zero dollars of public investment in this 
picture. 20 years later, after those businesses cycled through, some failed, some succeeded, the successful ones went from the wooden shacks to brick and stone buildings. This is the same street 20 years later. So they went, they got a little wider, they got a little taller. We have new people coming to town. The shacks we saw in the first picture are now occurring one block out. The success here is attracting new investment. The private sector is investing into this location. At this point, maybe they have invested some public dollars um, into this for maybe a fire brigade. Maybe they need a police officer because the billiard hall got a little out of control. Uh, but we can see this development, this natural progression occurring in the town. 20 years later, after that picture, those brick buildings turned to stone. Lots became consolidated to bigger buildings. We start to see businesses here that are more recognizable. Maybe brands are coming in that folks that are coming off the railroad would be familiar with. At this point, <coughs> folks have probably realized that schlucking water up to the third floor of the building is a difficult thing, or that the outhouse in the back doesn't make sense. So they're investing now in water and sewer, and we can see paved streets and a drainage system that is now occurring after this private investment has come in. This is the traditional development pattern that we see across the entire globe. If I was to take all those pictures and put it in a graph, this is what the graph looks like. You can see on the far left that solid lines, those solid lines are the private investment being made into this community. Each one of those uh, upward spikes is the new shacks being built. It stabilizes as those businesses get successful and stabilize and, and grow. And then you see from that, the next spike is that next phase of development that occurs. This is where the private sector is leading and visioning out the future of development for their community. Once that wealth and that investment has been made, things start to happen on the public side. The wooden shacks, those business owners understood that a fire is a high risk to their personal investment, so they're going to invest in the fire department. The next thing is that we need to get running water for the community, so that is now invested in here. You can see that all of the private, all the public investments are occurring after the private investment has been made and after wealth has been built in the community. There is a second development pattern that we have seen in the, in the United States and across North America that occurred after World War II. In that development pattern, it is now local governments and the, private, and the public sector that are making those first investments. Those investments we see here in Lake County are the infrastructure investments that you are making today. These are the roadways you're building in anticipation of new development coming in. These are the pipes you're putting in the ground so that Lake County can be the leader in how development forms here. This intersection here, there's a left turn lane and a right turn lane for everybody. You get your choice of two or three. There's sidewalks all around here with no development around it, but you could hold a 4th of July parade on here and walk around this. There's also the bike trail. It's a beautiful bike trail. It, you could have Tour de France. You could have any type of bike race here while you're having your march, while people are turning on all these lanes. You're making a bet on this development pattern. It's not just one intersection in Lake County. Your engineering department uh, per participates in our action team, and the county engineering department on their website have all these road projects that are proposed here in Lake County. What's interesting with all of these road projects is that uh, we can see those lines being built not where there is current development. They're being built out where you have farmlands. They're being built out through your conservation areas. They're being built in places hoping that the private sector follows that with investment. And the type of investment that they are following up on these projects is stuff like this. Within this 
picture all of those roads, all of those sidewalks in Lake County are being dedicated to your municipalities to maintain forever. <coughs> this is a much different development pattern and it has a different graph. On the left, you can see the dashed lines. These are the public tax dollars that Lake County is spending in this model. You're building highways, interchanges, turnpike extensions. You're extending water and sewer out all different areas throughout the county, making those investments, hoping that the private developers will follow behind. Lake County is taking the risk and the leadership in this development pattern to hope that these developments come in. And we can see the stuff that's coming in, the Walmarts, the Costcos, their cousins come in, which are the uh, fast food drive through areas, the drive through banks. Uh, eventually, as you're building more of this stuff, housing comes in. Uh, there's other retail that wants to come in, so you get the strip shopping. All that comes in as private investment after this investment. In Lake County, you're still going up. You're still spending, hoping that all the private development catches up to the amount of spending that you're doing in Lake County. If I put the models side by side, you can see the stark differences. So the traditional development pattern, you have the private sector investing, building wealth, properties are becoming more valuable, it's increasing what they're generating in tax revenue. The decision for the community is how to utilize that tax revenue to improve the community. The drawing on the right, you're making the bet ahead of time. We're gonna spend the money for the future that we hope we're going to get to build infrastructure to support development we hope we get. And then the things start to come in and get developed. In January, we shared uh, work that Urban 3 is doing uh, around the country. We do a lot of work with Urban 3. They do a value per acre analysis. It's a way to look at your city at a fiscal model in a different way. In this particular graph, this is Lafayette, Louisiana. We're talking about Lafayette, Louisiana because we have lots of numbers for Lafayette, Louisiana. The blue lines on this chart are areas in the city that are producing more tax revenue than the city needs to service the lots. Those are the most profitable lots within Lafayette, Louisiana. The red spikes are the areas in Lafayette, Louisiana that those properties are producing less revenue than it needs to service the properties. We can see all those red areas. Those are the areas that we are losing money in every day because it's costing more to service those than, it, it, than they are generating in tax base. Now, when we show this, I will show you what those neighborhoods look like because they relate to neighborhoods that we can see here in Lake County. Those blue spikes are these neighborhoods. This is downtown Lafayette, Louisiana, where the tall, tall spike is. You're not gonna see this on Southern Living. You guys are not gonna buy airplane tickets tonight to go to Lafayette, Louisiana to see that. It's an incredible downtown. There's incredible stuff happening there. But that is the stuff in their city that is generating wealth for them. The shacks down below, this is the most productive value per acre development in Lafayette, Louisiana. In Lake County, you have neighborhoods like this some of them have been identified as community redevelopment areas. Some of these are the, the kind of tired areas on the edge of some of the cores of your historic town. So there's some things here that you may be able to relate to. The red spikes are the images on the left. These are the commercial corridors. You have many, many of these. I could have swapped this out for uh, any picture here of Lake County. Uh, but that's Lafayette, Louisiana. Their new subdivisions they're building, they're nice. They're very nice subdivisions, but it's costing more to service those than the shacks on the right. The tax generation value per acre is greater on the right than it is on the left. This is probably, this is um, definitely challenging for many of the folks we've shared this with because it changes some of the assumptions and our biases that we have about our places. 
you have some really, really talented people that are working at Lake County in your engineering department. Your roadway people are really passionate about this stuff. They're on our action team. And they started talking to the mapping people and the assessing people. They said, how do we do a heat map for Lake County? They did a heat map for Lake County by taking all of the Avalorum taxes that you are uh, paying in Lake County and keying it to the parcel map and doing a value per acre analysis for Lake County. So we've done this and you can imagine the areas that we've described, your core downtown areas, we're seeing in the oranges and yellows as the most productive areas per acre within Lake County. The green areas are not as productive. They're almost nothing value per acre in revenue being generated here in Lake County. We wanted to take a look at this to see how this compares to some of the other patterns because we like looking at different maps. Um, going back to the Regional Planning Council, uh, how, how did we grow mapping? On the left, all the purples and pinks are all of the areas that have been developed in Lake County up to 2017. We see lots of purple and lots of pink all over that map. These are areas where new subdivisions have been built, roads have been put in, commercial areas have been put in. Uh, when I look to the map on the right, I'm not seeing a relation of blobs of orange and yellow to where pinks and purples are. We zoom in to areas where I see lots of pinks and purples, and I'm looking at the value per acre, knowing that the map on the left was 2017, so any property in there would be paying property tax today, <coughs> to the map on the right with the 2023 tax rolls. And we can see that there are areas that have been developed with obligations of infrastructure that are generating a tax rate equivalent to a citrus field, to cattle grazing land, to your agriculture undeveloped land in Lake County. The difference between these is that the cows that are grazing those fields are not expecting police service. They seem to figure out things, they're not robbing each other. Um, they haven't figured out how to use toilets or drink out of faucets, so they're not asking for water and sewer service. They are not causing traffic in your community, so they're not driving your roads. All those new subdivisions are putting those demands on your community, and all of your communities in Lake County have taken on a promise to maintain those. That is the suburban model that is occurring where Lake County has made the public investment first. This is not unique to Lake County. This is a development pattern that we have regularized throughout North America. It is unique in Lake County because you're willing to talk about it. We also started to talk to your engineering departments about some of these county projects that are out there. Uh, they're telling us that you're short $50 million for repaving and maintenance of roads. Not, not the neighborhood roads, these are just the county roads. So not the state roads, just the stuff that the county is responsible for. So there's obligations in Leesburg, Claremont, and all those places. But there's 50 million just on the county roads. At the same time, we're trying to figure out this number, but there's probably over $50 million worth of new roads that you're proposing in Lake County. So things have switched. You're not maintaining and keeping up the promises that have been made and you're chasing and investing new development. There's some real implications to this. I'm gonna stand behind the podium because this is where it gets um, a little dicey. These have serious implications for Lake County because this mechanism of growth that we've been accustomed to has been waning. We, we are not going to have these growth booms going again and again and again. We cannot account for growth to continue forward. And even if we do infinitely forward, it exponentially has to go to keep up with the stuff that we already have in the ground. Local governments are going to have to absorb all of those local costs for all this current development pattern. If you've been in any budget meetings, there's always stuff that has to get cut. This is what we're seeing. 
This is the dicey part. Under the current development pattern that you have here in Lake County, you can't do this without large tax increases or with large cuts in services. Now, I'm a taxpayer. All of you are taxpayers. Uh, we're not lining up to pay more taxes. That's not going to happen. Um, we're accustomed to a lot of services here. Lake County is a very nice place. Uh, you're not going to be cutting these services. We have to come up with a different development pattern to be more efficient. And I want to show um, a diagram that is within the budgets for Lake County. I'm sure all the cities have a similar diagram. This is actually a really informative diagram for all of us to take a look at. I wish more cities did it. Uh, this is actually a breakdown of your dollar for all of your property taxes that you pay, not to the cities, but your Avalorum tax to the county. The cents on this change a little bit every year, but the columns don't. Uh, currently, you're paying 27 cents of every dollar you pay in Avalorum taxes to the operations of your city, or to the, to the county. Uh, these are for the departments to operate. So we wanted to look at this. What is this really telling us about the development pattern and where your policies are focused uh, through their allocations? Growth is important in Lake County, so where are you investing growth? On your budget allocations, we added up the departments that focus on growth, expansion, new development, new businesses. This is your economic development department. This is your planning and building department that process all of those permits. Uh, this is your community redevelopment agencies that are in there that are focusing on getting new development, new infrastructure in. Uh, there's also debt service. We've got to pull into this column because we made investments on this type of stuff to get built and all that infrastructure to support growth. It's also in this. 11 cents of every dollar you pay in Avalorum tax to Lake County is focusing on generating growth in Lake County. But what do we put into maintenance? We've grown all of this infrastructure. Five cents of every dollar through the public works and engineering department is dedicated for maintenance. When I presented this to the action team, all of a sudden the, the public works department, engineering department jumped up and said, no, 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 it's not five cents. Um, it's actually less because we have to do other things than just maintenance. It's somewhere between two to three cents. So it's even worse than what is occurring here. To keep it simple, we kind of round it up a little bit, but four, you're spending four times more on investment to support growth in your county in this budget than you are for maintenance. So the departments you're funding, the budget policies you're making are focused on that growth within Lake County. So I want to hand this over to Chuck uh, so he can share some ideas and spark some additional conversation. <laughs> Um, and hopefully we'll share more uh, enlightening items than the dark doom and gloom I've shared with you. Solutions. <laughs> I, I want to give you uh, just one set of insights and then we're going to chat. Last night we were able to move all the chairs so everybody's looking at each other and that was pretty cool. I don't know if, I don't know if you want to do that again tonight, Norm. Uh, yeah, you do? We'll see. That would be really cool. Um, we've been... Uh, working here for half a year now and having conversations with people in Lake County uh, for much longer than that. And there's one thing that keeps getting given to me as an adage or as a fundamental belief or as something that we just, uh, as residents of this area, uh, believe is true at all times, not even questionable. And that is that we are going to experience lots and lots of growth. Even when I talk to people about the very nature of that growth, uh, they will say, you know, oh, Chuck, there's X thousand number of people who are moving to Florida every day. You're from Minnesota, don't you know? Like, it's all you guys coming down here. Everybody wants to be in Florida. It's gonna grow, grow, grow. We're projecting massive amounts of growth in the future. And everything is kind of premised on the idea of growth. So when we look at uh, the stuff that Edward shared, uh, we look at some of the, the stuff that Norm shared, um, a lot of this is like, okay, we, we get it, we understand, but, 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 we're gonna experience this massive amount of growth. Um, I, 
In Lake County, the sun is always shining, right? For, as, a, as an economic strategy, one of the things that you start to recognize when you do this kind of work is that uh, growth makes us intellectually kind of lazy. Uh, if we can count on or at least project out next year X amount of growth or X amount of this, it kind of takes some of the thinking out of what we have to do to make things work. Um, in the most optimistic sense, in other words, we look at the, the range of projections that are out there, uh, the most optimistic uh, projections for your growth has you growing 43% over the next two and a half decades, something like 140,000 new people. Um, that sounds like a lot of people, right? It sounds like a, a, a lot, a lot of people. And I, I recognize that. Um, but 43% over the next 25 years is not like an insane rate of growth. If I told you that your like retirement portfolio was gonna grow by 43% uh, over the next 25 years, uh, you would be firing your broker and trying to find something else, right? This is not an unmanageable rate of growth or a pace of growth that is unmanageable. Um, it's not like we're taking a population of 300,000 and making it two and a half million. We're taking a population of 300,000 and making it something like 450,000. This is not an absurd amount of growth. Um, but even with that number, I want you to consider a scenario where that doesn't happen. In other words, uh, when we go out and build these roads in advance of what we project to be growth, we go out and entitle land and then the entitlements say, this means we should build three extra lanes here and make the pipe extra big there and run this over there and over there. I want to just posit the question to you of what if the sun is not always shining in Lake County? What if that's not true? What if we don't grow as much as we're projecting we're going to grow? Um, there's a Upton Sinclair quote that I'm very fond of. Uh, it goes like this. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. When I step back and I look at all of the people, and let me just, you know, even despite the, the afternoon session we had today, which was a touch contentious, I will say that I am, I've yet to run into someone here in Lake County who is working in growth and development professions who I don't consider to be a good human being, a decent human being, there for the public good, doing good work, uh, conscientious, wanting to do the right thing. Um, even with that, it is very, I use the word, it makes us kind of lazy. It, it, it is very um, easy uh, to believe that growth is going to continue to happen, that we need to build this road, that we need to do this thing, that we need to expand here and build this and zone that and approve this. Um, if, you, uh, if your job depends on that happening, right? Um, and so I am the outsider here. Like my job does not depend on whether you grow or not, whether you add people or not. And I'm going to just, again, give you this idea that what if all the projections that everyone says you're going to have don't come true? What, what if uh, these things don't happen the way that people believe they're going to happen, particularly people who are involved in uh, the system of delivering that? This is the Case-Shiller Index. It's a housing index. It shows housing prices over time. Um, what you're looking at here is how housing prices change and have changed since the late 1800s. Uh, this is kind of a standard uh, measurement of home prices over time. And so if you look at this, you'll see on the far left, before World War I, there was a lot of volatility in home prices. Uh, during World War I, we standardized a lot of transportation systems and, and it had the effect of driving down the price of housing. Housing stayed down through the Great Depression and then after World War II we had an active strategy to grow our economy, build cities, grow a middle class by having uh, massive investments in housing. And you see housing prices go up and stay at a relatively stable pace uh, through that post-war boom period. There's a little uh, tick up during the 70s inflation. Uh, there's a 
boom here in the 1980s with the SNL crisis. There's a, a, a dot comish boom right here, and then we've got this, right? Which we all remember the housing uh, run up in the early 2000s. Uh, I remember being on the ground in Florida in 2010. And all the people who had been saying, we're going to grow, grow, grow forever, were saying what? It's, gonna stop. it's an apocalypse right now, right? Like, this is a disaster, right? What happened? Um, I give this to you because, you know, we had this period of time uh, between 2000. This is the same chart, but it truncates at 1987. So there's your uh, big run up uh, to the uh, to the um, housing bubble. Uh, we as a culture are very comfortable calling this the housing bubble, right? Very comfortable. Economists call this a housing bubble. Developers call this a housing bubble. Uh, investment people call this a housing Everybody calls this a housing bubble. We're comfortable with that. Um, but the question becomes, what do we call this, right? Which has happened subsequently. And it's interesting because when I ask people, they say, well, that, that's the housing recovery, right? <laughs> um, here is uh, the same chart from the end of World War II to the present. This is the peak in 2007, 2008. This is where we were at as of last December. And so I share this with you because it's very easy when you're in the eye of the hurricane, right? When you're in the middle of the storm to come up with all kinds of logical reasons why housing prices are as high as they are, why we're always going to continue to grow, why the growth is going to you know, accelerate up and we're going to have hundreds of thousands of new people and it's just got to grow, grow, grow. We got to build this highway, build this pipe, put in this lift station, do all this stuff. And I'm asking you, are the fundamentals there to support that? I don't know. I'm not here to tell you that you're not going to grow. I'm just here to tell you that if you're going to bet everything on red, you better have more confidence. You better have something more behind it than, uh, you know, this kind of data is perhaps suggesting. I'm going to give you three different ways to think about growth and development. And, and I'm going to say it this way. Strong Towns, as a, as a movement, as an organization, we think that sunny days are great. When the sun is shining and things are going well, that is just wonderful. Let's do great things when the sun is shining. Sunny days are fantastic. But if we create a development model that depends on sunny days occurring, we are being very foolish. There will be rainy days. There will be days when things don't work out quite right. We have to actually take that into account as we plan for the future. Um, I'm going to show you three different ways of thinking about growth. And I'm going to suggest uh, one of these ways is better than the other. This is a, a growth economy model. And what we see in a growth economy model is that uh, we can juice growth throughout our system so that during good years, we grow really, really, really fast. But the downside of this approach is that when we get to bad years, difficult years, everything falls apart and crashes. Okay, think 2001 to 2008, think after 2008, right? This is, this is our lived experience in a growth economy. We've been here, we know what this feels like. Here is uh, what I'm gonna categorize as a resilient economy. So in a resilient economy, we give up a little bit of growth in the good years. We slow down growth and we make some trade-offs and some changes. Maybe we raise our standards a little bit. Maybe we require different funds set up. We do different things that has the effect of slowing down growth. But we slow down growth because when we get to bad years, which we know are coming at some point, there will be rainy days at times, we don't crash so much, right? We're in a more resilient kind of position. There's a third strategy, and I'm going to quote from uh, Nassim Taleb, who's an, an author and a risk manager. Um, I would also call this a, a strong towns approach in addition to an anti-fragile approach. The idea that we have a development model that in good years grows, not as aggressively as a growth strategy, not as aggressively as a resilient strategy, but continues to grow during good years. And then when we get to bad years, also continues to grow. Maybe not as aggressively, but continues to grow during that period of time. I'm going to put all three of these together. In Lake County, 
we have a self-reinforcing cultural belief that we are going to experience massive amounts of growth. And so in a sense, we go out and we work very hard to make that happen. We go out and build things. We go out and do everything we can to try to make that growth happen. That is something that we have seen now for quite a while. And quite frankly, when we dig into the numbers, the numbers don't support it, and it makes me very nervous. Um, a resilient style of growth uh, would be something more akin to uh, going out and designing communities, designing neighborhoods, designing developments that at their start have a high return on investment, have a high degree of financial productivity. You and I walk around Celebration Florida. It's close to you. It's a model that you can think of. I don't think it's the perfect model for every place, but it's a way to think about growth and development. Celebration Florida has a massively high uh, degree of financial productivity. Those narrow streets cost a lot less than your wide streets. The homes there are spaced and designed and built to generate a lot of value per square foot. And in a downturn, uh, that type of a system will work out really well. The open question about a place like Celebration or really any new urbanist development is how do they do in the second life cycle? How do they do in the third life cycle? How are they gonna perform when the buildings start to get old and age and need upgrade and maintenance and that kind of thing? An anti-fragile system, a strong towns type system, uh, we can think of as, and I'll give you some local examples here, uh, I was able to visit Winter Haven uh, last month. Uh, fantastic little downtown. Um, a deep, deep commitment by a one major developer and then a handful of others uh, doing smaller work uh, to redevelop that downtown, not just with uh, shops and restaurants and touristy type stuff, but with offices, with uh, retail, and even more specifically with um, residential development now. Uh, developing the neighborhoods around that so there's actually an ecosystem of people who live uh, in conjunction with that downtown, can walk there, uh, can drive there if they want, but also have the opportunity to walk or bike or what have you. They're in a sense building their own market around the core downtown and having it feed on itself in a, in a positive feedback loop. These types of things grow albeit slightly more slowly than the hyper-growth economy that you've created here. Um, but during bad times, during lean times, there's actually a lot of reasons for people to move to places like this and live in places like this because as an individual, you can have a lower financial burn. Uh, and so these places tend to, in bad times, actually do quite well. You have a number of communities that have the same capacity here in Lake County. Um, we were in Claremont last night uh, we've spent some time in Groveland. Uh, we're in Leesburg right now. Like these places here have the bones and the uh, the framework to do this, albeit not the regulatory framework and some of the other things that would support that. Um, I want to I, I, I share this with you because, particularly this afternoon when we were meeting with a, a group of people doing. Uh, economic development and downtown work. Uh, I think we moved their cheese a little bit in a couple of ways. Uh, this idea, this cultural belief that we share, it's the thing that we all believe that we all believe, right? Is the way you think of it. Like, I may not believe this, but I believe that everybody around me believes this, right? Is that we're just going to grow. And that is like the given. And I want you to walk out of here tonight. Maybe you still believe that, and I'm not trying to convince you otherwise, but I want you to walk out of here tonight thinking that maybe not everybody believes it, because I actually don't believe it. And I think there's good reasons to maybe doubt it. And if you doubt it, um, even a little bit, we should be asking questions about how do we hedge our bets? How do we have a development style and approach that gives us all the upside of sunny days, gives us all the upside of growth? without the huge bet that gives us the downside if things don't work out. Definitely be sure to check out the Community Action Lab on the Strong Towns Academy, because that, that is more of an instructional opportunity with discussion built into it, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and so if that is the itch that you want to scratch right now, where you're like, keep going, keep going, uh, then that is a great spot for that uh, to continue.